Now before we continue, I do want to invite to come to the front those that went to SENT. SENT is the School of Evangelism in Texas, here from our little conference. And we had five, four, five, five, thank you, of our young people. It is a school of evangelism that only covers up to age 35. Anyone older than that? You can go. The purpose is they want the young people to get involved in church, get involved in the ministry. And so I, so I want to invite Clarity was one, I know Ricky was another one, um, Hannah was another one. And Ricky is, I forgot to let you know, if you see here, there, there he is. But you will come. And AJ Jr., if he is here to come. Am I missing anyone else? Teach, that's right, he's not here, okay. Just grab a microphone from anywhere here. And I just wanted to ask them, they went two weeks ago to San Antonio and to share, uh, to learn actually different things about how they can help out in church and, and in ministry. And so they were assigned a coach, I think, right? Okay. And that coach is supposed to get with me to make sure that they implement what they're learning over there here. So it doesn't do any good to go over there and learn, and then the pastor never gives them an opportunity. So, 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 I do want to just, anyone who speak or who wants to just, how, how was your experience? Was it worth it? Did you learn anything? It was two weeks ago for a whole weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So, somebody would like to share something about how it went, what you learned, what you liked about it? I'll go start. Um, I really enjoyed it.
they can live a healthy life, how they can get ready for Jesus coming. Because I know uh, the Lord is preparing us to live in heaven. So He is preparing us to this man to help us. So that was just amazing to take those two classes. And I am learning a lot and I hope I learn more and more in the other session. Remove the devil and his angels from 
this place in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. As our scripture was in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, I invite you to go there. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. The Bible here says all scripture. How much? All. Does that include the Old Testament? The New Testament? Everything. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Here, I wanted to begin with this text. What we are going to study next may, may just step on your little toes or on your big foot. But do we believe that all of this is inspired? Yes. And it's good for what? For teaching, for doctrine, for improve, for correction, for training. To equip you for what? Training in what? Righteousness. So that the man or woman of God may be adequately equipped. For every good work. So we've been looking at just as a review at the book of Daniel and learning from Daniel for these last day events. And in Daniel 1, we learned that these Hebrew boys were odd, were different. They did not, they stood on the principles that they learned from scripture. They learned from their parents, from their church, and they did not budge. Whenever the king came, the simple faith, he said, now they could have picked out the lettuce through there, but they said, no, we can't eat this. And Daniel chapter 1 wasn't so much a health message sermon, but a message on standing on the principles of God. Standing on the principles of God. We will have a health message sermon before this year ends, because the health message and last day events go together. Go, to, go together. Daniel chapter 2, we saw that the king had a dream, and this is the dream right here, the statue of the head of gold, arm and chest of silver, thigh of bronze, legs of iron, and feet of iron and clay. And we, we, the purpose of Daniel chapter 2 was knowing that God is in control. God is in control. Daniel knew, and his friends, by the prophecy they had studied, that they were going to be in Babylon for 70 years. 70 years, and they went in there as young men, so they knew they'd probably end up dying in Babylon. They weren't going to go back home, they weren't going to go back to Jerusalem, they weren't going to go back to their friends, their parents, they're going to probably die, but yet the dream God was letting Daniel and his friends know, it may look like Babylon will last forever, but it will not. I have the last word, I am still in control. I am still in control. So today we are looking at Daniel chapter 3. Have your Bible, Daniel chapter 3. And we're going to see what was the king's response to that dream, to that statue. <coughs> Today's sermon only has one point, but it's a big point. Daniel chapter 3. What was Nebuchadnezzar's response to the dream? Well, first of all, let's put a little context there in Daniel 2, verse 46. And in 2 verse 46, the Bible says, Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and did homage to Daniel and gave orders to present to him offerings and fragment, fragrant incense. Then the king answered Daniel and said, Surely your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, since you have been able to reveal this what was his response to the dream? Your God, Daniel, is a God of God. Your religion is a true one. All of my psychics and other wise men are no more fakes. Yours is a true one. Yours is a true one. But friends, just recognizing that the word of God is true, or saying amen at a certain point, isn't enough. It isn't enough. He praised the Lord. Every Knesset agreed, your God is a God of God. You're right. You're dead on. But it's one thing to recognize God's words. It's another thing to apply God's words to your life. 
we're going to see here, Nebuchadnezzar recognized, man, your, your God is God. Pray be his name. But he didn't apply the dream to his life. He didn't apply the dream to his life. And we don't know how the dream impacted Nebuchadnezzar until we read Daniel chapter 3, verse 1. Daniel chapter 3, verse 1 says, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, of silver, of bronze. Is that what it, is that what it says? No. An image of what? Gold. Of gold. And then it talks about the height and the dimensions. And put it in the plain of Jura in the province of Babylon. Now, if I remember here, you have it so you can look at it. Was the whole image of gold? No. no. Only what was? Yeah. Only the head was of gold. Daniel had told Nebuchadnezzar, you are this head of gold. But after you shall come another king. And then another king. And then another king. You, Nebuchadnezzar, will be replaced. And what was Nebuchadnezzar's response? No, I don't like that. I will take God's word. Was is is this God's word right here? Amen. Yes, it was. Has this happened to the letter? Yes. Absolutely. With Babylon, Middle Persian, Greek, Rome, and Europe divided. It's happened to the letter. Has Europe joined together? No, it hasn't. And it never will. This is God's word. But Nebuchadnezzar took God's word and made some tweaks to it. He said, I don't like God's interpretation. I will make my own. I will make my image of all. From the head all the way to the feet. His response to, to the dream was to create his own image, his own interpretation, i.e. his own Bible. He takes the word of God that he has said amen to. Your God is the God of God. Your God is the only true God. He takes that, but makes changes to it. Nebuchadnezzar said, I don't like this prophecy. I will rewrite it to make my own. I will rewrite what the Bible says to say what I want to say. Do you know anyone like that? I don't like, you know, but God says this, but, but I think, They take God's word and they put their own twist to it. Do we? Do you know anybody like that? Well, I can tell you. Where you can, I can tell you where you can find it. Would you like to know? If you look in the mirror, friends. If you look in the mirror. And don't get so offended yet. But in your heart of hearts, inside, deep inside. Have we not at one time or another taken God's word as it is and we read it and we know what it says and we say, well, I think the Lord understands if I think what God really means is and we make our image a goal. We take what the Bible says and sometimes we rationalize it into our own interpretation. Into our own interpretation. Think of the times that you have said, you know, I think God understands if this time I just don't return my daughter. I think God understands we are building our own image, our own interpretation. You really, you know, when it comes to the Bible, what I like about the Bible is that you really don't have to put too much thought to it. You really don't have to think about it. Because the Bible is clear and direct. Direct. Thou shalt not have any other God before me. Period. Put God first, 
maybe they've, they've, they've um, hurt you. Honor your father and your mother. That's the man you You shall not bear false witness against your neighbors. Period. Simple. What are they to think about? That's, that, that's pretty easy to, easy to understand. Don't talk about somebody else wrong or falsely. Even, by the way, a half truth is a lie. Even if you try to justify it, but you know, I am I am helping them, I am saving them from something. God says, don't talk about somebody else falsely. <laughs> Do not love the world nor the things of the world. There's no comma there, except in the 21st century. <laughs> God is plain and direct, clear and straight. And as humans, we find it difficult for anyone to tell us what to do. I don't like to be told what to do, and I know you don't like to be told what to do. So God here was telling Nebuchadnezzar what the future was going to be, what the dream was. He didn't like it. He didn't like to be told what to do. So he made his own image, his own interpretation, his own interpretation. The Seventh-day Seventh Adventist Church knows a lot of life. Amen. We are a church of the book, the Word of God. But it's interesting how among us there are still even independent Seventh-day Adventist various philosophies and groups. You see, there are some that don't do any shopping on Sabbath or eating out, and there are some that do. There are some that drink a little table wine, and it's good for the heart. The doctor says, Dr. Phil, I'm sorry, Dr. Oz. Because <laughs> <laughs> you want to help your heart, still we can do some food and do exercise. Amen. Some return tithes to the storehouse, to the church, to the conference, is how it's supposed to, and some feel, well, I can return tithes to any ministry that I want to. Some may wear a little shiny trinkets around them, some don't. Some are equally yoked and some aren't. What amazes me is that all of us have a Bible verse for what we want to do. If we're really honest, we all have a Bible verse for the little things that we like to do. And we forget, as we read in our scripture, all of the scripture is in Bible. Not just that one little word that like, oh, there I can do what I want to do. I found my verse. The whole Bible is inspired. And it's written and inspired by God. Not just a little verse here and there. The Bible says that there was gold, silver, bronze, iron, and iron, and clay. And Nebuchadnezzar said, mm, no. Why can't it be all? Why can't it be all? You see, there, there are people that once they have decided what is right for themselves, once they've decided for what they think is right, they don't care what anyone else says. Never can they care what Daniel has said. Some people don't care. I don't care what the pastor says. I don't care what your church manual says. I don't care what the spirit of prophecy says. I think that if there is any chance friends, that God is against something, if there is any little chance that God is against something, why even do it? Why push the envelope that close? How many of you will tell your spouses, men, let me pick on the men. I can't because I am a man. So how many men will tell their spouses, Honey, it's not really adultery, you know, if I go out to eat with so-and-so, a young, attractive lady. We're not going to do anything. Just have a meal. And, you know, we might have it a couple of times a week or a couple of times a month. But, you know, you're my wife. You know, it's no big deal. But you, you, you really dress up for that dinner. Put on that cologne and polish your shoes. How 
How many of your wives would fall for that? <laughs> wives, how many, how many of you will let your husband? Sure, go ahead, have Thank God I'm way rid of the hand. <laughs> of course not. <clears throat> the other way around. If the wife is saying, honey, you know, there's this friend that we're, we're best friends, you know. You're my husband, I love you. But you don't mind if you're my best friend, right? And we share everything. Any man in his right mind will say no. No way. Why? You're jeopardizing the marriage. You're looking for a divorce in the future. So why push the envelope when it comes to spiritual things so close that you're jeopardizing your relationship with him? The question shouldn't be, the question should not be, is it a sin? Is it a sin to go to the theater? Is it a sin to listen to rock? That's not the question. The question should be, does it draw me closer to God or away from me? The Bible doesn't give us a list of, you know, thou shalt not do, eat, here, go, there, no. God gives us a mind to think. We are not animals. <coughs> to, to, to think and to study and to learn and to apply the principles from cover to cover. Cover to cover. If you have to start a religious principle on what I think, or I can think the Bible, Dangerous, dangerous. You know why you're stepping on dangerous ground? Jeremiah 17 tells us why. Here, Nebuchadnezzar, we need to be careful before we criticize Nebuchadnezzar for building that image. When maybe we have sometimes have built our own images and our own interpretations. Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The Bible says, the heart is more deceitful than all else, and is desperately sick. The Bible says, wicked. Who can know it? Who can understand it? There it says, the heart. Is it, is it talking about your muscle in your, in your chest? No. Your mind, what you think, your thoughts, is more deceitful than anything else, and is desperately wicked, desperately here, Jeremiah is saying that you can't trust yourself. You can't trust your thoughts. Don't go by what you think. If Ecclesiastes chapter 9, turn with me there. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. The wise man.
warns us. Some go there. And there are some that may, that may feel, well, I don't feel any guilt when I do that. Or I don't feel any guilt when I go there or do this. That's got nothing to do with it, friends. If it's wrong, it's still wrong, whether you feel guilt or no guilt. The problem is, if you are judging what you do by what you feel or guilty or not, you're measuring, you're measuring that by what you think, instead of measuring it by what God says. Instead of measuring it by what God says. You have, you have to watch out. You have to watch out for your image made of gold. For your image made of gold. And that is why idolatry, idolatry, the worship of me, I idolatry. I. I don't think there's nothing wrong with doing this, going here, with being with that person, listening to this, being that. You put in the blank. You, you know your own life. I know my own struggle as well. You have to watch out for that image that you erect of gold. The worship of me, the worship of my thoughts. Idolatry is all about me. All about me. You know that there are hundreds of denominations in Protestantism? In hundreds of denominations. Why? They all proclaim you use this book that you have in your hand. Every single one of them, even this book is holy. You know why there's so many denominations? Because every single one of them builds an image of gold. Every single one of them found their verse and said, what does God mean this? And they find somebody else that thinks the same way. You know what? They start a little church. People build their images of gold. Finding a text or scripture that fits what they want. That fits what they want. They find themselves a few scriptures that forget the rest of the Bible. It's important that we study any principle you may have a doubt. Study it from Genesis to Revelation. Not just in that verse that you found it and say, oh, you see, there's nothing wrong with a little here. Paul is recommending Peter the wine. Study that out. Study that out. And you will see that the Bible that God is against <coughs> fermentations. Against wine. Alcohol. The whole Bible is inspired. All 66 books are inspired. You have to, you have to first study the Bible. And then you go looking for a church that comes closest. Not go to a church that makes you feel good and say, well, I hope that they're studying the Bible forever. You study the Bible and you find a church that comes closest to it. The mistakes that Nebuchadnezzar made was that he wrote his own Bible to fit his desire. He wrote his own Bible to fit his desire. Before we criticize him, friends, how many of us at one point or another, are guilty of the same. Are guilty of the same. We know what God said, but well, we think God understands this time. He set up His image above the Bible. He set up His image above the Bible. We need to be careful we don't set up our opinions above the Bible. Our, our opinions are just that. Our opinion. <coughs> my opinion is just my opinion. It's not what thus said the Lord. He gathered around him those who agreed with him. There in Daniel chapter 3, verse 2. The governors and all those who agreed with him. And you and you find that sometimes. You know, those those that like to break the Sabbath by eating out. By the way, I'm not going to deal too much about the Sabbath right now because we're going to spend the whole summer dealing with the Sabbath and last day events. So, 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 we'll, we'll wait for the, the summer for that. But those that, those, those, that, those that like to break the Sabbath, they hang out with other Sabbath groups. And they criticize those that are not thinking how they think. Or those that maybe like to go to certain places or like to wear certain things, they hang out with a like people. 
And Nebuchadnezzar did the same thing. He gathered around him those who agreed with him. But notice verses there in Daniel chapter 3, verses 4 to 7. Daniel chapter 3, verses 4 through 7. He demanded worship of that image. Daniel chapter 3, verses 4 to 7. Then Then the herald loudly proclaimed, To you the command is given, O people, nations, and men of every language, that all the that at the moment that you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, and all these other instruments, for you fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. But whoever does not fall down, worship shall immediately be cast into the midst of a fiery furnace of blazing fire. Of blazing fire. So here Nebuchadnezzar said, everybody needs to agree with my interpretation. This is how I think the future is going to be. It might be forever. And if you don't agree with it, you get thrown into the fire. You know, if you join me in Revelation chapter 13, there is something very similar in the last days that will happen. Revelation 13, verse 11 to 15. <clears throat> somebody else will also call to worship somebody else's interpretation. Somebody else's image. And if not, they will be put to death. There, Revelation 13, verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming up out of earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. He exercised all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and he made the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast. Notice, he made. I don't know the word for that. He forced. He made them worship the first beast, whose, whose fatal wound was healed. He performed great signs so that he even makes the fire come down out of heaven to the earth in the presence of men. And he deceived those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which it was given to him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. Verse 15, And it was given to him to give bread to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast would even speak and call as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be what? Killed. To be killed. Friends, there will come a time where people where, where, this, where this beast will say, you need to worship my God, my God, my day. And there needs to be a group of Hebrews of Seventh-day Adventists who will stand up like these Hebrew boys and say, remember the Sabbath day of the So there, Daniel chapter, Daniel chapter 3. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord that these three boys purposed in their heart. You remember studying that in Daniel chapter 1. They purposed in their heart <coughs> not to bow down, to be pure. We will not accept your interpretation. And, and anyone who will survive through the last days will have to give up on leaning on their own thoughts. If you're going to survive, friends, the last days, Make it faithfully. You have to stop leaning on your own thoughts, on your own interpretations, and lean on the God. Lean on the God. God, with all truth, He tells you where it is. This is what I expect you to do. You need help? That's why I give you my son. We can do all things through Christ, who gives us the strength. Daniel chapter 3, verse 16 through 18. I love their response. 3, verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king. You see, the king had given them a second chance. You didn't, you didn't like you didn't like that praise song? I have another one for you. Bow down for that one. 
Here, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the people, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give to you an answer concerning this matter. Why? They've already purposed in their heart. It is to be, it is, if it be so, our God, who we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But, verse 18, even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your God or worship the golden image that you set up. If faith is not worth dying for, if faith is not worth dying for, then faith is what you lack. Amen. If faith is really not worth dying for, then you need to ask God to strengthen your faith. Amen. Strengthen your faith. Here the young man said, we're not going to bow down to it. Our God can deliver us. But if he chooses not to, if he allows us to be burned, what did they, what did they say? Let it be known. We still ain't going to worship your interpretation. We still ain't going to worship your image. We're still going to stand on what God said, which God said, gold, silver, bronze, iron, iron, not all of So I appeal to you today, church, to give up idolatry your thoughts, your ways, and accept the Word of God. Accept the Word of God. You decide to give up idolatry in this modern world, friends, I guarantee that you will go to a fiery furnace. You will. You will go to a fiery furnace if you give up idolatry. If you bow like the rest of those people in Daniel, you don't look to, to, to no fiery furnace. But if you decide to stand on the dust, says the Lord, right? you will go to the fire. Standing on God's word will be less and less popular in the world, and sadly, less and less popular in the seventh day Adventist church. Some of you are finding that out in your job and friends and family. Friends. But maybe, maybe sometime, Along the way, you made your image based on your thoughts. But you know, we serve a merciful God. We serve a forgiving God. What does he say? First John, that he is faithful and true and just if we confess our sins. To forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Friends, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and true. Cleanse us and forgive us. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. And these boys stood firm and not worship someone else's interpretation of Scripture. I encourage you to stand on the Word of God. To stand on God's Word. When others are influencing their interpretations, you stand well. My, the Word of God says this. Thank you. What the word of God says. But everyone's doing it, Harley. That's right, everyone else bowed down. Thank you, but God says this. Friends, wait till next Sabbath. Because if we push God and push the envelope, well, how close can I get to sin without actually crossing over the cross? If we push God to the limit, we're going to see in the next chapter that God may push back. You don't want God to push you back. So I just invite you, friends, to stand on what God said, whether it's popular or not. Whether people are practicing it or not, either in the church or out of the church. And I know we have some, some college students here from our own colleges and public schools. Stand on what God says, on the principles that you know, that you know. 
Regardless if your teachers or friends are doing other things around you, only answer to God. We only are accountable to Him. For standing on what says the Lord, you will go through a fiery furnace. But praise the Lord, we see here the story ends. How it ends. Were they alone in the fiery furnace? No. Whenever you stand for Jesus, whenever you stand for God, you never stand alone. You never stand alone. To begin with, you have your angel right there who is writing it down. She stood for God. Let me put this in bold. And you have the Holy Spirit keep standing for God. Helping you. And Christ is in the heavenly sanctuary. That's my son. That's my daughter. Standing for me. There. Verse 24, Daniel chapter 3. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and stood up in haste. And he said to his high officials, Was it not three men he cast down into the midst of the fire? They replied to the king, Certainly, O king. He said, Look, I see four men, and what? They're loose. They're not even tied up. They're loose. And walking about in the midst of the fire. When I get to heaven, friends, I'm going to have God to show me that. I want to see what the king saw. And God will replay that for me. I love the next verse where it says, Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the furnace of blazing fire. He responded and said, Shepherd, Bishop, and Benigo, come out. Now, if you were with Jesus in the fiery furnace and you're walking around, I mean, my response would be, I'm fine here. I don't need to come up. Friends, what was their response? Our God is able to deliver. If He chooses not to, I will still sacrifice my life for them. For his name. For his name. If faith is not worth dying for, we need to have and build more faith. Here they were not alone. Jesus was with them, and never forget, Jesus will be with you whenever you stand on solid ground, the rock. If you stand on shady, sandy ground, you're standing alone. And the waves will come, and what did Peter say? We'll blow the house down. Wash it away. You won't stand. But if you stand on the rock with this Christ, you will stand with him. Never forget that you are never alone when you stand on him. In these last days, we are living in the last days. We are. I know it. There are things happening, not just in the world, in the church that are embarrassing and disgusting, I will not mention it because it is God's church. I will not criticize His church. But I know we are living in the last days. And praise the Lord, this is His church. He will take care of it. And He will bring a shaking that only those that are standing in Him, with Him, will come out of that fire of God. So church, I want to invite you are you willing to stand in God's Word? Yes. Are you sure? You know, the only way you can stand in God's Word is if you spend time in it. Reading it and praying and building that relationship with Jesus. When Jesus went into the furnace, I'm sure they recognized him. Thank you, Lord. We talked to you before coming in, before being thrown in, in here. Good to see you. You know the Lord when you spend time with Him. When you spend time with Him. And let's not try to push the envelope and damage that relationship with Jesus. By questioning, well, is it a sin if I do this? How close can I get to it? You're jeopardizing your relationship with God. For church, I just appeal to I appeal to you from the bottom of my heart. I want every single one of you to make it to the kingdom of God. Amen. Every single one, from the balcony to the one sitting.
here, to your family and friends members that are not here yet. Amen. Also. But we need to stand so they can see what a standing person looks like. Amen? Amen. If that's your desire, friends, to stand on God's word, I invite you then to stand as I have a little word. Father in heaven, Lord, we are standing here demonstrating that we want to stand on your word, not on our thoughts, not on our interpretations, our ways. Lord, we don't want to erect our own images. We want to bow down to you and accept your will in our lives. We may not accept it or understand, but we follow by faith. I just ask you, my God, that you bless everyone here, that you strengthen them, that you strengthen their relationship with you, that you strengthen their prayer life with you, and that you be with their friends and families that maybe at one, at one time they walked with you, but now they won't. My God, bless your church here in Cleburne and all around the world. That we may be able to stand so when the fiery trials come, we know that we will not stand alone, that you will be there. Thank you, Lord, for hearing my prayer. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. I invite you to remain standing as we sing.